I think many of you know, but I'm Dave Renz. I direct the Midwest Center for Nonprofit Leadership, and it's a pleasure to have you back for session four of this cycle of the Nonprofit Navigation Series. This cycle meaning the series that is, um, is particularly focused on <clears throat> excuse me, on design thinking and different aspects of design thinking. As most of you probably are aware, but just to be explicit, um, these sessions are intended to be freestanding sessions, but they also do connect to each other. And so you're welcome and encouraged to go to the box uh, utility that is, it was in the uh, email that you received queuing you for today's session and uh, review materials from the past, the worksheets and other things that we've shared as, as we've gone through there. Um, I will be partnering this morning as, uh, as we have throughout this uh, part of the series with Monica Rizak. Monica, do you, Monica, do you have any uh, words of warning or greeting? <laughs> I don't think so. I think we're ready to go. Welcome everyone. All right. Well, so let me work with uh, Dr. Helms slides and we'll <clears throat> get into a bit of this. Now, as, as always, please do feel free to send questions and seek clarification via the chat part and we'll, uh, we'll address them as they come up and uh, we'll have a typical standard. We'll go until approximately nine o'clock and then we will uh, take a few questions and then we will transition into the uh, breakout rooms for the last 20 minutes of the session. And we do ask that you uh, provide us with feedback on the sessions as always. So, you know, today um, we're, we're looking at this, the segment of uh, design thinking, the design thinking process that often is labeled ideation, certainly a jargony word that a lot of people may or may not um, relate to in any substantive way. But the essence of it is uh, the stage of the process where we are, <clears throat> excuse me, where we're looking at actually uh, creating solutions, but exploring and developing a lot of opportunities or ideas for solutions and then selecting among them. So we're building on the previous concepts of, um, of design thinking when we're talking about this. In other words, going early in the stage, you're gathering information, you're trying to understand and, and really one of the things that I always like about Scott Helm's description of design thinking is the importance of empathizing. <clears throat> and uh, with, without meaning to poke fun at any of us with a lot of experience at, uh, at uh, program design, program development and design, I do need to say specifically the, the fundamental shift in mindset, as you're probably aware of design thinking, is to start with the user in mind as opposed to saying, I have a problem or I have an idea, a solution. Uh, and candidly, so many nonprofits that we work with have started off because they had a solution to take to the marketplace. But the flip orientation is design thinking and really saying, before I create a solution, how about if we really take care to understand the problems and the issues that our clients are experiencing? And, and from that, and that included a substantial amount of, um, should include research of various types, whether it's the fancy sort of formal research or some of the other ways we described in previous sessions. But from that information, then we need to be growing uh, options that are solutions and then selecting among those solutions to determine what it is that might be of greater versus lesser value. So our agenda today is to focus on these two key pieces of the puzzle. In other words, the ideation <clears throat> part of, uh, of what it is that we're looking at. And we do, I do wanna go back for a second and just say, it's essential to separate these things. And candidly, one of the things I'll probably say too often today, but I really do want to underscore it is how frequently I encounter uh, folks who in a, in a well-intentioned effort to make a difference in the lives of their clients find a solution and then just run with it because it's the first one that meets some minimal uh, criteria, if you will, for what it is that's, that they think they need to address. The jargon phrase for that, by the way, since we're using words like IDA, the jargon phrase is satisficing. Um, satisficing is a very common phenomenon where people 
encounter a problem or an issue and they immediately have some minimal set of criteria, maybe not even are overtly defined or articulated, but they have something in mind. And so as soon as they find that first solution uh, that even minimally meets those standards, then they just stop. And candidly, today's session is all about getting around that or working through it to not fall prey to the problems that are, are really, uh, it's, it's not delivering the full value of what it is you could. So that's the creating solutions part of it. That's what we're talking about when we're discussing ideation. Um, so this ideation in the, you can see sort of in vague in the background of the slides there, ideation is uh, the step that comes after you have gone through the empathizing in other words, trying to understand and appreciate the conditions and circumstances that are your clients or those that you want to benefit from a program or a service would have. But rather than assuming you know what it is they have uh, in the way of needs, interests, pain points sometimes, I don't care a lot for that phrase, but it actually does describe what sometimes happens. Unfortunately, I think the stories we're hearing about, for example, the, uh, the uh, unemployment system in Kansas very clearly, we're talking about a process that has pain points and it has consequences for folks. So trying to empathize and understand from the perspective of the client or participant what it is that's, that they're experiencing and where we're going with that. And then moving into the defining stage, which is gathering more information, but then clearly defining the problem. And I'm going to pop ahead and then come back to this because one of the critical things that you've heard in the previous parts of the series, if you've been participating, is the imperative to move from identifying problems to creating solutions through the use of a well-articulated problem statement. And we have previous sessions that go into a lot more depth on that that Monica and Scott have presented. Uh, one of the points here, a fundamental point I should say, is that if you have done a good job of articulating what the problem really is based on the situation, the, um, the empathized conditions of your clients, the odds are you will be much better equipped to get into the kind of exploration and creativity of the ideation stage. Now ideation actually is, if you've seen the flow of design thinking uh, and how this process works, you may have noticed that there are a lot of loops back and forth because the reality is you go through empathizing and defining, you ideate, in other words, you come up with some solution options and determine which of them would be of greatest value to explore further and then you develop a prototype. But then it's common that you use that prototype to actually spur additional thinking. And so you may go back and forth from prototyping to ideation, um, and, uh, and even from the testing at the later stages in the process. So again, uh, you're working from that position of, of, um, of strong problem statement. And candidly, if you haven't crafted a problem statement, <clears throat> we encourage you to, to take the time before getting into solutions. Um, we, have a, we have a cultural characteristic, certainly not limited to the US, but we, we see it a lot, and especially when we're under stress and time is tight and we're trying to really be innovative uh, in a very fast cycled way, we immediately jump to solutions without clarifying what is the problem for which this is a solution. By the way, that's just a good question to ask. When somebody comes in and says, I've got the answer, we need to do X. It's kind of like, maybe it's obvious, but unfortunately it often is not. What is the problem to which that would be the solution? and making sure that you have among your group, um, and it's ideally uh, a process at the ideation stage that involves a group of people uh, because you can come up with richer results and options. But that problem statement is so significant. Monica, do you want to, is there anything you wanted to say about problem statements as we spring into this uh, next sort of phase of it? Sure, I would just reiterate that I think through all of these stages of the design thinking process, um, like we've mentioned previously and then again today, it's just really important to stay open. So it's helpful, it's useful to create that problem statement. Um, but again, we'll see even in today's presentation that it's just really important to um, stay open to possible solutions and then always be circling back. So 
Um, we mentioned the IDA, you're empathizing first. We, we talked a lot about the qualitative research going into the step, but they do cycle through and you can go back and revisit other stages and that'll help you to identify potential um, problems that might help you to adjust your problem statement. So I think the most important thing is to just to keep that, that open mind, those open perspectives as you're going through this process. Thanks. Yeah, it's, I mean, the ideation statement, I've never particularly liked the word because it seems so jargony, but the whole focus is about coming up with multiple solution options, not just one. Um, the idea is to be creative, to be curious. Uh, this can be among the most fun of things. Well, I shouldn't say that. Research is fun in a lot of cases too, but this can be something that a lot, a lot of uh, our organizations and our staffs and our constituents can have fun with. And the idea here is that you think about new options and ideas, but you continue to do that um, so that you don't fall prey to that one and done kind of a thing. The thing, one of the challenges that I personally have observed with the groups I've worked with is that it's hard for them to, in, to feel comfortable investing enough time in this, that they'll come up with multiple solutions and ultimately then synthesize the best of a few of them to move forward. And so that becomes a real critical kind of an issue. So we're going to spend some time here talking about, you know, how can we trigger new ideas? Um, I do want to flag that it, the process to be really uh, effective in this means that you're getting ready. You're not just walking in one day and sitting in a conference room or by yourself if you're doing this alone and thinking these things through. You want to be clear about that problem statement. You want to make sure if you're bringing a group of people together, as often can be the most useful way of doing this, you want to share that problem statement so that everybody is on the same page, at least in general, with regard to what it is you're working on. And then sharing the research of, uh, of your previous stages of work so that people have that information and that frame of reference, if you will, before moving into the idea development or idea exploring stage. This is often a time, I mean, essentially always to do this well and be as uh, capitalized on the creativity of a group. It's very important to have a facilitator. I'm not saying it needs to be an outside facilitator. Uh, that often can be useful simply because having an outside facilitator allows everyone who's a regular a part of the regular group, let's say you're doing this with a team within your organization. Um, if somebody who's in a significant management role also is the facilitator, it means they're juggling back and forth. It creates a certain dynamic that may hinder or, uh, or, or at least narrow the range of ideas that people are thinking about. So, uh, or that they're willing to share with each other. So a facilitated process is important. And frankly, one of the questions to consider is who should we involve in this process? And there may be a logical group. Uh, it, I mean, maybe it's just you, but often it can be beneficial at this idea stage to be bringing additional people together and maybe in multiple sessions. You don't just do one session, but you actually bring folks together and try to invite different sets of constituents to be creative in bringing up lots of ideas before you get to the next stage where you start winnowing and bundling and determining which have the greatest promise. So being ready for an inclusive and engaged and creative process is really significant. And that includes bringing you know, constituents who have enough familiarity with the research and the problem into a session or two so that you can do this. And doing that, believe it or not, I mean, I know this isn't a surprise to most of you, but it's really important that uh, you create a space, and I'm talking about both physical space and emotional space, for a creative session to, to play out. You know, the, the number of times that I've uh, been invited to do some process like this with a very well-meaning corporate executive who wanted to share the best of their company. And so they brought us in and we met in the corporate boardroom. That is not actually a great setting for equals to share and brainstorm without consequence with each other. Um, you know, these rooms are often very nice. The furniture is great, but the truth is they're often 
overlaid with power dynamics. There, sometimes you end up with one group of people at the table and another group sitting around chairs around the outside of the room. Think about those kinds of things. You want a comfortable space with enough room to move. And as we're gonna share in a couple of minutes, some of the methods for getting creative really can capitalize on or even require a larger space so people can get up and move around. That actually is part of releasing some of the creativity of a group to be able to get people to engage with their whole body, not just with their brain and their mouth uh, and not just along sort of the usual kinds of, of uh, patterns, if you will. We're trying to break out of those other patterns. And of course, you know, we'll come back and talk about some of these specific things, um, but uh, you know, how do we trigger those ideas? There are multiple methods and uh, brainstorming is something that people often think of. Brainstorming is a great time-honored tradition, although we often honor it in, uh, in, shall we say, principle rather than literally making it work well. And so that's a little bit of what we need to talk about here as we continue with our session. So fundamentally, one of the core questions is how do we trigger new ideas? Mo Monica, do you want to just talk about this for a minute? And We've got this you know, one way of playing with this idea, uh, this concept as we go through this too. Yeah, so there, there's lots of ways. There are lots of ways that you can go about this. So this slide is showing you some questions that are prompts that you could ask yourself or the group of people that are working through this process of coming up with ideas, um, thinking about what possible solutions would be. But before you even get to the, the possible solutions, you just want to put yourself in those other um, situations where you might be thinking of things in a different way. So we talked about before creating potentially user profiles or thinking about things from other people's perspective after you've gained a lot of information about the community that you're working with or the group that you're trying to create something for. And so you could think back to those user profiles also and ask yourself questions um, potentially from their perspective. So that's one way to do it. Um, you can ask how other organizations or other companies would do it. You can do this, and we'll get into this a little bit more, but in that kind of physicality of really getting creative and using your whole self and your whole team, you can write the questions down on Post-its and put them up on the wall, and then you can categorize them in that way. But it's really meant to be a guide to help you kind of move through the thought process by asking these questions. So you don't want to jump too quick to solutions. You really want to spend some time in this space and think about um, all of the potential perspectives. So the, the questions you see here are part of a tactic that you might call association or analogizing, where even though Disney and Disney World may not be very fitting for the setting you're thinking about in a literal sense, you know, how would they? How would the folks, you know, Disney's pretty, pretty significant as an actor that's both innovative and responsive to the ideas um, that, uh, that their po prospective participants would like. So how would, how would a Disney artist, how would a Disney game designer, um, how would, you know, lately, how would Google do this? Um, and, you know, it, trying to put yourself, your frame of mind in somebody else's perspective is really different. And again, you know, one of the things that's so striking to me about the three actors identified in this slide, they're just sample questions, but one of the things that I find so significant is they're all very um, attentive to the question of what's the flow of experience? What is it that the user is experiencing? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you know, candidly, it's one of those things we've been trying to pay more attention to uh, in some of the previous sessions Scott's mentioned, as you may know. Uh, you know, at the university, we all of a sudden got slammed into doing all of our instructing remotely in the middle of this last semester. Well, now we're trying to actually learn from that and go back and say, well, what has been the user experience, the student experience? And not just simplistically, you know, one of the things at UMKC we try to be attentive to is what's the experience for a student coming from a family where nobody's ever gone to college before? Um, what's the experience of a student who's got to earn income while they're also trying to participate in classes and earn a degree? And if they have limited experience with uh, higher education, how can we help them? We need to be seeing it from their perspective. How do they feel and what is it that's going on? 
So when we're, um, when we're thinking about ideation methods, there are lots of different ways that we can play with these uh, concepts. And frankly, you've heard many of them, but I wanna go back and remind you of them and also, uh, I guess, bug you a little bit about them. Uh, because we often claim we're doing these things, but we're actually not. Uh, now, as the slide is intended to illustrate, we're looking at strategies that, that bring together lots of different perspectives and we're trying to resist judging them until we get them all out. In fact, one of my favorite creative thinking ideas is what would be the worst way to address this problem? I don't suggest you spend a huge amount of time on what's the worst way because you don't want to develop a really lousy plan so that you can be proud of how lousy it is. But the thing is, if you think about the worst and then play, what are the opposites? What else? Okay, so, you know, I mean, to go back to the student example, you've got a first time student coming to the university. How about if we don't give them a map of the campus? How about if we don't tell them where the counseling center is? How about if we don't even tell them how you get a parking permit? The ugliest of all things in higher ed, but you know, I mean, and ironically, we sometimes end up replicating the very things that we put on our worst list, but using it as a springboard to then go to the next question is significant. Um, you know, so brainstorming is a great tool if we do it literally. You all know the rules of brainstorming already, mostly which is there aren't rules, but you just get it all out. And frankly, you know, the folks who write a lot about ideation break these into very fine distinctions, but um, you know, the simplest version of this is, is simply what you'd call a brain dump. Just people in a room uh, just getting everything that they know and think about this situation out onto a whiteboard or onto post-it notes or some other place so that you can just get all of those things out because there will be seeds of great solutions and strategies down the road if we can get all of that stuff out now. And frankly, just getting a brain dump from a fairly diverse group of people can add a whole lot of perspective that you just might not think to, to structure in or build on, and that's unfortunate. Now, brainstorming, of course, is a little more facilitated where everybody shares their first reactions and ideas and, and gets uh, those ideas out. Um, <clears throat> the folks who develop these models often like the word brain. So there's brainstorming and brain dumping. There's brain writing, which candidly in my world, I've typically called the affinity process where you have people rather than interacting, you're sitting alone writing on individual post-it notes, you know, one idea per post-it note. By the way, I mentioned physical space earlier. One of the strategies that we've used sometimes that has been interesting and some groups have told me it's been quite a lot of fun is to use an application of the so-called world cafe method where people get up and move around. You've got a large room and you've got a specific question, facet of the question at each of a dozen tables or maybe it's three tables and small groups go from table to table for a fixed period of time. You write things out and then you move on and another group comes behind you and they react to, they either validate and say, yeah, I like that or I thought of that, but then they also add their own ideas. Nobody takes away, everybody adds in so that you're accumulating these ideas. And then as time goes on, you can, you can get a really very large comprehensive list. Sometimes that, the volume of ideas scares people, but frankly, there's some fairly easy ways and we'll come to talk about those in a minute. We've been using in some of these processes, uh, the Qualtrics system to, um, to gather initial ideas, even from people before they come into a room. By the way, Qualtrics is our version of SurveyMonkey, where you just pull it all together and then you can actually start to build on and take those ideas to the next level as you're uh, developing that process. <clears throat> some people, uh, if you've got folks who are even slightly interested in artistic things, maybe come together, whether it's World Cafe or even just working individually, drawing sketches. Sometimes, by the way, this can be particularly useful if there's a, a, a visual and experiential dimension to things that can be especially highlighted through sketching of one sort or another. We don't need to be great artists, but we can simply have people sketch out ideas and then have folks shift, work in small teams, and then have people shift so that the next group can come in 
and they could build on the ideas of the previous group or they could actually add additional ones that they didn't see that were there. Again, the idea being that we're drawing a lot of different ideas in and getting them. We're not going to judge them yet. We're simply thinking about, by the way, I do encourage people to go back to that problem statement so that you are reminding in that sense, that's the one grounding that probably is particularly significant here. Monica, do you have thoughts about additional strategies and principles here? Yeah, so I think, again, it's just, it's really thinking of those ways that you can be um, open to new ideas and you can get creative with the process. So one thing that it makes me think of is in our kind of current in-between place with our workspaces, some of us are still at home, obviously. Um, some of us will be transitioning back into physical spaces together. That might look different in the future. And so thinking about how we can do those things and apply those tactics in kind of a new and reimagined space. Um, so a lot of those can be transferred to um, people coming in, doing things in um, dif at different times and putting things up on the wall and then others can come in and respond. That actually has a benefit to it. Um, someone can come in, write down questions, put them up on post-its, that sort of thing, or do, we'll talk about this kind of like a dot voting system where you, um, you put your preferences on there and then others can come in, do the same. Um, that can also be done in a digital space as well. So this might be beneficial if you're working with people who aren't in the same work, you know, the same office or the same city as you even. So this is something that you can transfer to that kind of online space as well. So thinking about that and how it makes sense for your organization um, as times are shifting and things look different in our workspace, but also as people are being more collaborative and using this process in different ways. And then you have the next element of this, which is the second part of what we want to flag as, as we uh, pull our session together here. I've been hammering home the idea of don't judge, just get as many creative ideas as possible out as soon as you can. But once you have gotten to that stage where you have a lot of ideas, then the question is, well, what do we do to actually winnow these down? Some of you have, well, many of you undoubtedly have participated in parts of this kind of a thing. Um, frankly, you know, it often doesn't seem like a separate stage, but if you go through an affinity process, the, the process of writing little ideas on post-it notes, then, you know, one group calls what we do, I never called it this, but they call it octopus clustering, putting those post-it notes out and then letting people cluster them according to the affinities or the things that they think are more or less connected. You get all of those individual ideas, and then the next point from there in winnowing is to say, okay, what are the key themes and insights that are here? Sometimes you'll actually say, well, what's missing? And so a way to stir some additional inputs is to get all of it out and then say, is there anything that we're really missing that's just crazy? We ought to have this up. Uh, the idea of putting things in clusters is, you know, the jargon phrase is it's bundling, but whatever you want to call it, it's finding the commonalities and themes and then working with that to determine what it is that you might do. Now, as Monica just said, um, if you've got a huge number of ideas, uh, sometimes it makes sense to actually use a digital system like uh, SurveyMonkey or something like that. And I'll come back and talk in a minute about one of the ways we've done that. Um, the time-honored and sometimes maligned uh, dotocracy or voting with dots or whatever you want to call it, the formal name is, is multi-voting, um, it's illustrated in the slide here because you've got folks who did their sketches, but then they're actually voting on the ones that they find of, of greatest interest or value. Um, the, uh, the process actually works quite well overall. Uh, you usually want to have that bundling happen first so that you've got things clustered together in themes or, or uh, well, themes and even sub-themes, and then you rank those that have the greatest potential. By the way, it's a good idea to clarify the criteria you're going to use. I find that this helps groups think about that, but you don't have to agree on it because part of the creativity comes from people bringing different criteria to the exercise. Oftentimes, it can be useful to actually go through cycles. You'll come up with the ideas, put them on post-it notes, bundle them, determine which of them are most useful. You can use the dot voting for 
hierarchy to determine, well, let's say the top 10 of that set, then you could actually, if you've got a situation where it's worth taking the time, you could go back and do another cycle of affinity and, and brainstorming and storyboarding in order to get more refinement and richness. Here, you're not just looking for brand new ideas, but you're using the inputs to inform and enrich the ones that you think have greater power. Again, uh, you can see the slide has an illustration of a group doing this on a table. This is a variation of what you can do with the World Cafe notion, where you're going to different stations and ranking, well, which of the ideas are of greatest value here or there. As you, as you get into the next steps of this, um, one of the things, there are multiple ways you can sort these things out. Um, a simplistic thing, we'll post something like this on the, uh, in the box after uh, the session today, but uh, we've got just this, I mean, again, you don't have to make it a complicated thing. What is it that we might think about in terms of ranking ideas? Monica, do you want to talk about this uh, matrix for a minute? Yeah, this is really helpful. This is a nice tool and you can use it as an individual. You can use it as a group. Um, you can categorize on your own and then come together as a group or you can do it all as a whole. Um, but it's really meant to be an idea selection tool. So it helps you determine okay, what is possible right now? What's maybe our core things that we really need to address and that we're able to address? Those can go in your now column. Your wow might be something that this could be added value. This is something that might be new for us that we could do, but we can do it. It's more feasible, um, but it's something new and might elevate those kind of core things that we're meeting. Um, when you think about future and how and things that are maybe not possible right in this moment, um, but seem like might be something worth exploring if they're a new idea and something that you feel could really move the organization or the idea forward. That might be something you put in that how column or box and think about this is something for the future. How might we go about um, addressing that and working toward that over time if it's something that we're not able to do right in this moment? Um, but really, it's meant to be something to help you categorize your ideas, help you to select those and narrow those down, because as much as we do want to be open to lots of different ideas and perspectives, at some point, you do have to kind of narrow that down and start to put a plan together of next steps. So this is just a helpful tool um, to help move the ideas and move the group forward. Thanks. I would, what I would uh, add to what Monica has described, I like, I like this, um, this two by two grid. Of course, the world is run by those who impose two by two grids on folks. But you know, so you've got two dimensions. How original is it? How feasible is it? You want to, you may actually find it useful to talk about the criteria the group would use to judge feasibility and the criteria you'd use for originality. Frankly, the other thing I have done um, that complements this is to add yet a third dimension, which is harder to draw on the graphic, but I actually do this through Qualtrics, where I invite people in the same way that they're rating originality and feasibility, I've asked people to rate usefulness of the idea. And if you do this through Qualtrics or a SurveyMonkey kind of a thing, you can actually produce a matrix that highlights which turn out to be rated most strongly on feasibility, originality, and usefulness. I have candidly, when I've worked with large groups, I used this kind of a process, for example, with a group on homelessness a couple of years ago, and we did the winnowing through Qualtrics. And the last thing I asked people is to just say, well, if you had to pick one of these five, the top five, of this whole huge list that you'd say, this was something we should explore. Um, I, the last question they ask in the survey is, would this be one of your top five? And then we've got a, a narrowed list and you can start to see, well, where and how do we actually rank them? Is there a consensus around a few that seem to have particular value and impact? Um, or do we need to go through a couple more cycles of winnowing in order to do that? So uh, we're at the stage where we can take a couple of minutes of questions. We will, uh, in just a few minutes, shift into our breakout rooms. Monica will be managing breakout rooms as she uh, always has. So I'm going to stop the sharing part of this now and just invite folks, if you have um, questions,
questions or, or clarifications you'd like uh, to request. <laughs> I, I do see in the chat room, Michelle Gilbert has uh, highlighted that we often ask, how would Chick-fil-A handle this? I think, yeah, that's a striking thing. I mean, you know, again, when you're thinking about, uh, you know, who has, who has the sort of values and principles and characteristics that you'd really care to, to exemplify in your process uh, or your results rather, that would be, uh, that would be really great. Uh, Phyllis Becker asked if we can get the PowerPoint. It is, uh, the PowerPoint is on the, uh, in the box for today's session. Uh, the box address was provided in the email that invited you in for today. Mark Culver has also posted in the chat room uh, to everyone the uh, actual login for that as well. <coughs> so, Sharaz asks, do we have resource links with sample questions that might help us to lead toward taking others' perspectives? Uh, some of this is, um, is uh, really front and center in the sessions that Monica and Scott presented in the last week and the week before. Monica, would you just talk for a minute about uh, sample questions and then we, we will post some others. Uh, <clears throat> it's my rec recollection that Monica and Scott actually recorded a follow-up session to the public one that you can access in box to uh, get more information. And again, Monica, perhaps you could just explain that briefly. Sure, yeah. I mean, um, when there are questions that we haven't had time to answer, there's a supplemental chat there that we record and add to our files. Um, we can do that also for this and talk a little bit more about those questions. We can also include a resource page um, as a link with some of those sample questions. But it's definitely something that um, there aren't like a specific, there isn't a specific formula with all of this stuff, which um, is like the good part and also it makes it a little bit tricky sometimes is that there isn't uh, like a set, you know, um, lineage of questions that you would want to work through. It's definitely something that you're going to be thinking about who the end user is with all of these. It's really important to keep in mind that this is very human centered, very end user approach. And so you want to think about questions determined by the community or the group that you're working with. So those questions might look different depending on what problem you're trying to solve or what group you're working with. Um, but as far as specific questions, we can definitely give some like good prompt examples and I can include those in the resources. Thanks, Monica. By the way, mm -hmm. at, at risk of highlighting um, a um, competing institution in town, but uh, they, they do great work there too. Um, there's an entity at KU, at the University of Kansas, uh, called the KU Center for Community Health and Development. They have a, a uh, website called the Community Toolbox, and it has very useful basic instructions and explanations, but then sample worksheets and questions that facilitators and those planning processes can use to organize and then execute, uh, carry out the um, the work of facilitating a, uh, a session. One of the things that I want to go back and just highlight again, you know, Monica said it and we've said it a lot, but a key difference here is to, is to really build on and work from the perspective of the client as you're trying to think about what is of greater versus lesser utility as you're winnowing these ideas out. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's take a few minutes here to, um, to uh, just share, again, part of the value of getting together on these Tuesday mornings is, <laughs> is to re reflect on our transition as a community as we're progressing in these uh, sort of challenging times. And I think it's probably even more challenging now than it was three or four weeks ago as we're all trying to figure out how do we just make a transition from a relatively complete shutdown to this intermediate stage. A few weeks ago, I talked about change management and the real difficulty of making your way through the so-called neutral zone, that zone in the middle. We're in the middle of the neutral zone and it's driving people nuts in many different ways. So I encourage you to uh, you know, turn on your cameras and Monica will pop you into breakout rooms. We'll be in breakout rooms for about 15 minutes and then at uh, 9.30, we'll come back together and uh, thank you and send you on your way. So Monica, Shall we break out?